continuing our message on the life of David uh, as we started last week. As you know, we said we had an eight-part series. No, literally two. <laughs> I study like it's an eight-part series so that that's all prepared and whatever's needed in the moment comes out. Amen? And that's the way we should all prepare. Uh, God is into preparation. So I have a joke for you because I love to make people laugh. I feel like it opens us up. It gets us in a different place. It's just a quick, funny one. Are you ready? Who loves Christian jokes? Good humor. A man is in the woods and suddenly a bear pops out and starts chasing him. The man is terrified and begins to pray. He prays frantically, Lord, please make this bear uh, be calm and, and uh, like more like a Christian, more peaceful. Don't let him eat me. Suddenly the bear bows his head and begins praying, Dear Lord, thank you for this food I'm about to receive. <laughs> On that note, let's pray. Father, we just thank you. Hallelujah. We're so humbled to just be able to be in your presence and that you made a way for us to come right to your throne. We're so thankful. <laughs> we don't live in the Old Testament like they did. What, what beautiful things they learned and, and how they, they knew your holiness and they saw you in a different way and they came with all these things. But Lord, by your blood and by your body and by what you've done for us, you've made a way for us to come right on in. And so thank you. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us this morning, Lord. Let it not be our words, but your words. Your words, Jesus, are spirit and their life. Lord, I thank you that your word is powerful. It's sharper. Lord, it's like a two-edged sword and it divides our soul and our spirit. And so, Lord, I thank you for speaking to us this morning, Lord. Uh, I pray just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, he said, let my speech and my preaching not be in enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And so, Lord, thank you for using us, using Rian and I this morning to bring your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So for those of you who don't know us and those who are watching online, we are pastors Rion and Holly now. Um, we are directors over, and most of you know us, but in case there's one that doesn't, we are directors over Explore Nations Bible College here, right here. Our campus meets right here. It starts, guys, September 3rd. Those of you who don't know about it or those who are returning students, we start September 3rd in just a few short weeks. And it is the joy of our lives to serve these guys in that vision. So we are continuing. Last week we talked about David, his heart, and his fight, and his legacy. Uh, this week we're going to talk about David's life of leadership and the lessons in between. So I'm going to dive right into that. And actually, I was thinking this morning, this really isn't, you know, the Holy Spirit is so good. He gives us messages out of our messages out of our messages <laughs> by the Holy Ghost. And I felt really prompted this morning to tell you guys um, Jeremiah 29 11 before we get started. And the Lord says he has plans for you. He has plans he wants to show you. He has plans to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. And I'm telling you that, that this morning, you may have heard that scripture a thousand times, a million times, and you're like, that, you know, that's old. That's old news. Guess what? <laughs> I remember the first time I heard that. Um, my dad, actually, my brother Joe and his wife Julie are here this morning. It's so nice to have them. Uh, they came last week, too, but I didn't want to embarrass them that last week, so now I'm embarrassing them. <laughs> I remember the first time someone told me that scripture, and it was actually my, my dad, my earthly father. And I was about 15 years old, and he took me out to breakfast one morning, and he shared that verse with me. And it changed my life. 
I finally knew it wasn't just my own plans and my own ideas and my own design of my own life. I don't even get to make my own decisions, but God has a plan for you. Amen? And you can know that plan. You can know it specifically. You can know it clearly. You can know it in every season of your life. Amen? And that's what we do when we come here. I was thinking about this thing we do called church. Been pondering over it this week. You know, there's so many different ways, right? You've got the Eastern church and how they do things and they meet in homes. And then you've got our Western church in America and we do all, we do what we do, right? But what's the purpose of the church? Ephesians 4 verse 11 says um, that he's given, let me look it up so I'm reading it actually correctly. We like to read the word correctly. God gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. And what I love about this church, our church, Church at Glass Chapel, our family, our staff family, is we literally have this beautiful group of people that are, I mean, Pastor Russ and Judy Joe are apostles. They have been sent ones. They have done specific projects and specific things, and they've pioneered. They've gone places where there has been nothing and created something with God, literally from the ground up. Amen? That's who our pastors are. I feel like that's like my banner. This has nothing to do with my message. Okay, well, it does. Obviously, it's the message of the Holy Ghost. I feel like that's my banner and that's my sign and that's my declaration so that we can come to understand what anointing we're under. Amen? We're under apostles and then prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And what's it for? It's not for us. It's not so we, because we have special things to say. It's for this equipping. There's an equipping in your life. And if you sense it, you sensed it in worship this morning. And we sense it as, as people are ministering the word. And as we come up and as the word is going forth. And then the flow of the Holy Spirit is happening. There's literally equipment in the spirit being handed out to you this morning. And you might think, well, that sounds kind of weird, like <laughs> equipment, like, you know, I've got all this equipment in my garage. It fills my garage. My husband has a lot of equipment. What are you talking about? No, I'm talking about equipment in the spirit. God's equipping you in the spirit as you come here. And he's edifying you and he's building you up. And why is he doing that? For the work of the ministry. But here in our minds, we think to ourselves, the work of the ministry is her job or our job, the people who are, quote, in the ministry. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. And dare I say again, no, it's not. You are living epistles read of all men. That, that's what the New Testament says. It says you are a living letter. It's not just this book that we read. Your life is ministering and is speaking and is a letter written to the people around you. Amen? Hallelujah. And so when I talk about spiritual equipment, you receive that in your spirit. Your spirit is an eternal it's an eternal being. That's the real part of you. That's the part of you that came from God when you were formed in your mother's womb. That's how God can say, I knew you before you were formed. And then he put you in your mother's womb so you could take on a flesh and a soul and come into the earth. Amen? We're going deep this morning. Is that okay? <laughs> And then we come out and we live this life and we're living from this higher place. You're not living of this world. Oh my goodness. We aren't just living a life of the flesh. Yes, we do all those things. I get up in the morning, I get dressed, I do my hair, thank God. We put on our makeup, thank God. We do all the things that we need to do in this natural life. But our life is so much more. Amen? So as we go into, I haven't even looked at my notes yet, but that's okay. So as we go into David's life of leadership and how he led, these principles are part of your spiritual equipment. Amen? 
Um, and then after, so I'm going to share a little bit more about this. So David led as he was led by God. David led as he was led by God. We talked about that last week in 1 Samuel 23. Uh, he was told what the situation was, and he knew what the natural circumstances were, and then he went and inquired of the Lord. He investigated, he looked into, he talked to the Lord, and he got answers, and then he obeyed. Amen? That is how we're called to live. That's how you get your plan. Maybe some of you know part of your plan. Some of you know I'm supposed to do this, or I'm in college right now, and this is right, or I'm getting this job, or I'm launching this business, and you know what part of the plan is. But then he wants to lead and guide you in all the details of it. Amen? So David led as he was led by God. I have so many points that I'm not even going to get to. <laughs> So point number one is don't lead out of your flesh or your soul or on natural principles alone. And that's not just for ministry. That's in business, your family. It's in everything you do. The conversations you have, the interactions you have, we're not to be doing it from our flesh. I mean, it seems like duh, right? We know the works of the flesh. They don't bear good fruit. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, they don't bear anything. But the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22 and tw through 23 produces great fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then it says, there is no law against these things. Literally, nothing can work against that. Amen? <laughs> so flesh and soul responses will not bear good fruit as leadership. Now, some of you might be saying, you know what, Holly? I just, I don't think I'm a leader. <laughs> I'm not a leader. I'm not called to lead. So this message isn't even for me. Yes, you are. <laughs> He's calling you up higher. He's calling you to a higher place of recognizing your leadership in your family, in your workplace, in your community, and in what he's called you to do. Remember, he has a plan for you. Amen? When I first came, long, long story short, some of you have heard bits and pieces of it, when we first reconnected with Pastors Russ and Judy Joe about 10 years ago, I came in to, I hadn't seen them in years. We'd worked in the ministry together years ago, and, and so much they had poured into our lives. Then they went their way, we went our way. I remember walking back into these doors after they bought this place. And um, Judy Jo was sharing a message that day from Exodus 3 about Moses. And it said that Moses turned aside and saw God. And then God began to speak to him. He said, here am I, Lord. He saw that burning bush. He saw what God was doing. He saw what God was saying. He knew that God had a plan for him. And he finally gave his life and said, here am I, Lord. And God began to speak to him about what he was supposed to do. I dare say to some of you today, this is your moment to turn aside and see. That's what this church is about. That's what this place is. That's what Explore Nations is. It's your moment to turn aside and see all the power and all that God is doing and what his plan is for your life. Amen? So I'm going to go into just a few more points and then hand it over to my amazing husband, who is the love of my life. Amen? <laughs> so... Uh, let's see, where am I at? My notes. So, when I shared last week in 1 uh, Samuel 23, it said there that he inquired of the Lord. And so, I am asking you today to begin to inquire of the Lord in every area of your life. I'm calling you up to a higher place and a greater challenge to do that. Amen? God has your where, he has your when, he has your what and your how, and he, I mean, we know our why, our why is all over the word, we don't even have to question that, and remember I talked last week about stop asking why God, why did this happen to me, or that, or this didn't go right, or that doesn't seem right, and why is this not working out? Shut it down. 
Get your when. Get your where. And some of you, where is your location? Your when is your timing. Some of you have got those pieces down. Live in your what and in your how. What do I do next, God? What do you want me to do about this? How do I handle this? What do I do today? What do I do next week? You're starting to inquire of the Lord, and then you trust that he's actually going to speak. He hears you, and he speaks to you. How does he speak? Number one, he speaks through his word. And don't discount that. Sometimes we're looking for this rhema word from the Lord, this specific spoken prophetic word, and he's got all those. He's speaking those all the time. But when you don't have that, he takes you back to the logos, to his written word, which is more powerful than any prophetic word is anyway. So when you don't know what to do in a situation, you ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? What is, how do I handle this? And from the word, he'll show you. From the word, he'll show you. He'll teach you how to talk to people, how to deal with people, how to handle hard situations, how to lead. David led so many people through the fight all the time. He led hundreds of people through dozens and dozens of battles. So why are we waiting for the easy times? Sometimes we're waiting, well, Lord, I'll do that when. I'll do that. I'll lead when this looks like this. Or I'll decide to step out and do something when this is all figured out. No, no, and no. He's calling you up higher. He's calling you to live a different way. He's calling you to lead through your fight. Amen? Be the example. Be the answer. Sometimes we're looking for the mentor. How about you be the mentor? I used to wonder, Lord, why will nobody mentor me? Why am I not in this situation? This was years ago. Why has nobody, you know, seen me and seen what I want to do and brought me alongside of them? <laughs> well, maybe he's calling you to lead. <laughs> maybe he's calling you to just obey the word and step out and lead. Amen? Amen. Oh, my goodness. Well, let me give you a couple scriptures about how he's going to lead you and then pass it on over. Proverbs 20, 27 says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. So let me tell you how he's going to lead you. It's going to rise up from the inside. Sometimes we're looking here, there. We're looking for answers all out here. And we just get quiet and we just pray in the spirit and the answers rise to the top. Amen? Out of your spirit, man. Out of your time with him. Out of your praying in the Holy Ghost. And you might say, well, I haven't prayed in the spirit in a long time. Okay, start today. Forget about that. Come right into now and do it now. Or I haven't spent enough time in the word. Oh, you have. The word you've put in you, it's living in there. It's a living word. And it'll rise up. Open the book and read it again. And let him speak. Amen? Okay, so John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. He'll not speak on his own, but he'll tell you what he's heard, and he's going to tell you about the future. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things I've said to you. He's living in you to lead you. He's living in you to lead you as you lead others. Amen? Amen. Men, so take us into David, honey. Tie that old back together, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, part of, of leadership, part of what God's doing, it's like when we look, I want to look back at just with David's life. Who were the people that he took to a different level, right? Because... <laughs> I heard this guy years ago said, you know, it's like, if we want to get somewhere in life, you need to hook your little car up to somebody that's going somewhere, right? So, and I've looked for those kind of people around me to be like, who can I hook my little life car up that is going somewhere? So if we go back to 1 Samuel 22, verse 1 and 2, it says, so David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So we know Saul's trying to kill him. Right, this is where we start this off, right? And he says, soon his, soon, listen to this, soon his brothers and all he, the other relatives join him there. Now, I understand sometimes in ministry, family doesn't always join, right? 
So it seems like you got something that, that God wants you to do is if your relatives and everybody in your family starts joining you. Anybody in here felt their family has left them, right? You pursue God and then you're all on your own, right? His whole family came to join him there. And it says, then others began coming. Many were in trouble or in debt or who were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 men. Now, imagine that. It's like, that's a great way to start out, right? You have people, I think that King James says, they were discontent, in trouble, and in debt, or discontent, and in debt, and dis distressed. Yes, that's the word, distressed, right? This is a great group. This is how he started off. This is the group of people he started with. Anybody want to do that? You want to start off with that? God calls you in the position and is like, okay, this is what you get to start with. Like, don't, I'm not signing up for that. Thank you. Pass. Please pass over. Give them to Joshua. He's got great leadership skills. He can do all of that, right? I'm like, I don't want that one. <laughs> but so let's see. I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff because there's somewhere I want to get with this, and I think I can get there this morning. My brother-in-law said, hopefully there's not 28 more parts to go, right? <laughs> so I'm like, there's not. I, we're going to land the sucker sometime today, right? So in sec, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recap some of the things because of where we want to go. Second Samuel 8, I'm going to give you guys some highlights, right? So this is, David started with this group of people, bad, bad bunch. But then Second Samuel 8, verse 1 says, David defeated and subdued the Philistines. Verse 2, he conquered Moab. Verse 4, captured 20,000 soldiers of Hadadazar. Verse 5, killed 22,000 Armenians. Verse 13, so after he did all of that, it says he became even more famous because he killed 18,000 Edomites. So think about this. He's already killing all these guys. He's doing all this stuff, and then he becomes even more famous because he killed another 18,000 people. Okay? And then in verse 15 of 2 Samuel 8, it says, So David reigned over all Israel and did what was just and right for all his people. So keep that in the back. He did what was just and right for what was for all the people. And I wasn't going down this path, but I feel like I need to. Um, in the midst of all of this, in comes Absalom. You guys know the story of Absalom? Okay. Absalom was one of David's sons. Um, I'm not, without going into all the detail, he had a sister. His half-brother raped his sister. He killed his half-brother. He flees from Jerusalem to go live with his grandfather, gone for three years. David wants to spend time with him again. So long story, he comes back to be with David. Um, spends two years in Jerusalem without seeing his father. And finally, David kind of reaches out to him. and He's like, okay, kind of opens up the doors for him to be part, to come in again. So in the midst of all of this, I want to read a scripture in 2 Samuel 14, just to show you who this guy was, right? In verse 25, it says, Now Absalom was praised as the most handsome man in all Israel. He was flawless from head to foot. There you go, Joshua. There's your scripture. <laughs> he cut his hair only once a year, and then only because it was so heavy, when he weighed it out, it came to five pounds. So this is the guy, right? Who does he remind us of? Saul, previous king, right? He's the dude, handsome. He got the looks of what, the, what a king leader should maybe look like, right? The Bible doesn't say anything unless it's necessary to say that. You know, God doesn't waste words and everything. But we get into 2 Samuel 15. And so as we're going into this, just listen to this. I'm going to read some scripture. So it says, after this, Absalom bought a chariot and horses, and hired 50 bodyguards to run ahead of him. He got up early every morning and went out to the gate of the city. When the people bought or brought a case to the king for judgment, Absalom would ask where in Israel they were from, and then he would tell, uh, he would tell him their tribute. Then Absalom would say, you've really got a strong case here. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear this. Okay, pay attention to the words. Then Absalom would say, you really got a strong case. Too bad the king has nothing, don't have anybody. Verse 4, he says, I wish I were the judge. Then everyone could bring their cases to me for judgment, and I would give them justice. 
When people tried to bow before him, Absalom wouldn't let them. Instead, he took them by their hand and kissed them. Absalom did this with everyone who came to the king for judgment, and so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. Four, and so this is going on for four years. So listen to this. People come to the king for judgment. He's sitting in the gate. So he's sort of cutting them off right there in the gate, and then he tells them, man, the king doesn't have any time for you, but I got time for you. Right before they could speak to the king, he is sort of cutting that off, and now he becomes the man that they're bringing everything to. Does that seem a little deceitful to you? Just hold on. It's getting better. <laughs> Verse 12 of the same chapter, it says, While Absalom was offering, so Absalom asked David to leave to go offer sacrifices, lying to his father because he had a plan. He wanted to put his plan in place. He thought he can do a better job. Verse 12, while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent to Ahitophel, I slaughtered that, one of David's counselors who lived in Gilho. Soon many others joined Absalom, and the conspiracy gained momentum. So as I'm saying this this morning, please understand where I'm coming from. I'm not pointing fingers to anybody, not implying about anybody. But God put a leader in place. God anointed a king in place to lead the people. So what did David do for the people? We read in chapter 8, he killed people, right? He led the people. He did everything to protect the people. And what does Absalom do? He come in from the side and try and take the kingdom away from his father, which was the one that was anointed as the king, and, tr and turn the hearts of the people away. How easily do we forget what the king has done for us? What did Absalom do for the people? Zero. There was nothing that he actually did for the nation other than deceiving them. Okay? So, then he anoints himself as king, right? David flees, and we'll go to, um, we'll go to 2 Samuel 18, and I just want to read that. So, David flees with a bunch of people, and then decides to go to war against Absalom, okay? In verse 5 in 2 Samuel 18. So in the midst of this, where his son is taking the throne from him, where the people turn their hearts to the deceiver, because that's what happened, right? They turn their hearts to the deceiver. He deceived them by giving them pre pretty words. You know, it's like, well, thank you for helping. And it's like, no, no, no. It's not me, it's you, let me just kiss you, it's I'm here for you. That happens, that happens with a lot of leadership, okay? It says, and the king gave his commandment to Joab, Abishai, and Ittai. For my sake, deal gently with young Absalom. And all the troops heard the king gave this order to his commanders. In the midst of that, they're going to war against him. He tells his commanders, be gentle with my son. That's where the heart comes from. That's where his heart is at. Here's somebody that deceived him. Here's somebody that turned the hearts of the whole nation against him. And he still says, be gentle with my son. Take care of him. Verse 6 says, so the battle began in the forest of Ephraim, and the Israelite troops were beaten back by David's men. There were a great slaughter that day, 20,000 men lay down their lives. 20,000 people died because of one person's deception. He deceived the nation, and 20,000 people died because of his deception. Let that sink in for a minute. Right. I, didn't, I had no idea what Holly was going to read this morning, right? And she read the scripture. God placed people in positions. Prophets, Evangelists, pastors, teachers, apostles for the equipping of the saint. God placed them there. And it's easy for us to think, that's us. It's easy for us to think, well, it's me. This is all me. Look what I have done. Yeah, it's right. 
It's easy for us to do that. Yeah, I'll just say that. Um, it's easy to, you know, when we stand up here and we bring a message, and, you know, even last week, Holly and I bring the message, and a number of people said, thank you for that, that was amazing. And thank you for that. We appreciate that. It's necessary when somebody brings a good message to say, that was good. That was anointed. You know, we appreciate the word that has gone out. But it's also important for me to stand here and know that this is not me and this is not my pulpit. Right. I'm not the pastor of this church and the leader of this church. There's somebody else that has been anointed to be in this pulpit and to be the leader of this house. I'm just here to fulfill the call and the part that God has called me to do in this house. And it's important for us to understand, and this goes for everything, for every area of our lives, right? It's like there's, there's people that are God have placed in positions of leadership. And it's easy for us to, to do, um, what was the word we're looking for? Um, discontentment bonding, right? We're discontented, and then we bond together. And then we have the same issues. I have an issue with Joshua, and you have an issue with Joshua, and you have an issue with Joshua, and we bond together because of our issues. I don't have an issue with Joshua. I love him dearly. <laughs> right, just, but I know I can use him as an example, right. It's easy to do that, and we forget, right. Who was the one that God anointed as the king? It was David. He's the one that fought the wars. He's the one that stood in the place. He's the one that has gone out and sacrificed his life and everything that God has placed on his call, the calling on his life in order to protect the people and in order to lead the people to where they need to be. We need to understand that and we need to recognize that. And it didn't happen, in Israel's case, it didn't happen overnight. It took four years for Absalom to, de to deceive people and to turn their hearts away from the king. And the result of that was 22,000 people, 20,000 people died because of his arrogance and what he thought he is supposed to be doing. And then David still turns around and he goes back to Israel and is like, are you done now? I'm back. You want to anoint me as king again? This is what I have done for you. And he has not done anything for you. And so it's important for us to understand, even as we're here, even in this house, who is the leader, who is God appointed by God, and who are the people that are there to help. And we are here to help. That's what we are here to do. Enough of that. So here's the result, right? And I'm going to jump over everything so we can wrap this up. And 2 Samuel 23. So where did they start? These guys were all discontent. They were in distress. They were in debt. Right. How did they end? And I'm going to give you guys just some highlights on this. 2 Samuel 23. We'll just do in verse 8. So it talks a little bit about David's warriors. Right. So here's this guy. Joseph Bashebeth. Okay, say that five times fast. Right. He was the chief of the officers. It says he wielded his spear against 800 men that he killed at one time. 800 men. One guy kills 800 men. Then you have Eliezer. But Eliezer stood his ground and attacked the Philistines until his hand was tired and stuck to the sword. Judy Joe loves this scripture. And the Lord brought great victory that day. Then the troops came back to him, but only to plunder the dead. So one guy killed the Philistines, attacked the Philistines. Then we have Shammah. I love Shammah. He's my favorite. He took, his hand, he took his stand in the middle of the field, defended him, and struck down the Philistines. So the Lord brought a great victory. Um, so then it talks about, uh, so David is in the stronghold. You, we've heard the story where he just utters, man, I wish I had a drink from the water from the well. Right. So three of the dudes broke through the, through the Philistine barrier to go get him a cup of water. That's the impact that the leader will have if he truly leads his people. It's like three guys attack a whole army to go get the king a cup of water because he wanted a drink. Then there's Abishai. He was Joab's brother. 
He raised his spear against 300 men and killed them, gaining a reputation among the three. Right. Then Benaniah says, he went down in the pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. He, he went in a pit and killed a lion. Okay. He also killed an Egyptian, a huge man. Even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaniah went down to him with a club, snatched his spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Who does that sound like? Kind of sounds like David and Goliath, right? These were the exploits, blah, blah, blah. This was, okay, so that's enough of that, right? Then he goes on about all these other guys and what they've done. This is the impact that the leader had on their lives and what they have attained. Okay, now, as we're wrapping up. So we know David wanted to build a temple for God. And God said, because of the wars that you have fought, the blood on your hands, he was not allowed to do that. So, he knew that Solomon was going to do that. So, in 1 Chronicles 6, uh, 22, verse 6 um, and 7, it says, uh, no, verse 7, Then my son, David, uh, my son David said to Solomon, It was in my heart to build a house for the name of Yahweh my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, You have shed much blood and waged great wars. Okay, this is what God told him. He cannot do that. Verse 14, he said, this is out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible. He said, notice, I've taken great pains to provide for the house of the Lord. 3,775 tons of gold. So this is what David prepared because he was not allowed to build the temple. So where did they come from? They were in debt. Right. But he set his heart to prepare for the house of the Lord because he was not allowed to do that. He set his heart to prepare something for the house, for the temple to be built. And it's 3,778 tons of gold. So I did the math yesterday. One ton is 32,000 ounces. So 3,775 tons is 120.8 million ton ounces of gold. The gold price Friday per fine ounce was 22, $2,337 $2, per fine ounce, which means 375 tons was $282 billion. So where did David come from? He was in debt. He had a bunch of dudes that was with him in debt. And he ended up, and this was from the nation's treasury, right? $282 billion just in gold, let that sink in for a minute. That's what he prepared. Then we go to 1 Chronicles 29, verse 3 to 7. So this is David. He said, Moreover, because of my delight in the house of my God, now I give my personal treasures for gold. This is his personal treasures that he's giving. Um, 100 tons of gold. This is David personally giving 100 tons of gold. That equates to $7.5 billion. Personally, David gave $7.5 billion of gold for the temple. And then it says, verse 6, Then the leaders of the households, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and the hundreds and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. Man, we should give willingly, right? They gave willingly. They didn't get to bribe. They didn't were bribed to give in this offering, right? It's okay. Don't get quiet now. It says they gave 185 tons of gold. So here's the guys that were in distress that were in debt, that didn't have anything. And they end up giving 185 tons of gold, which is $13.8 billion. So let that sink in just for a minute. God placed a leader over the nation. God placed a leader over people. God placed a leader over people that seemed like God had nothing going for them. And over a period of time, he completely transformed their lives. Right? They rose up to be mighty warriors. There was an anointing on David's life to be a warrior. 
Right. There was an anointing on David's life to subdue nations and kingdoms. And when you read through that, it just is like mind-boggling, all the stuff that he did. It's like war after war after war that he has gone to. There was that an anointing on his life that did that, and that flowed down to everybody that was following him. But there was also an anointing on his life to prosper, and that flowed down to the people underneath him as well. To go from being in debt to be able to give 180, uh, you know, $7.5 billion from David and $13.8 billion from the people. And as a nation, God prospered them to give $282 billion just in gold. That's none of the other stuff. That's just gold. We don't have time to go in all the other things. So when God leads us, when God brings us in, that, those leaders that God places over us are going to help us to get to those places. I'm not saying every one of us are going to give 13 or 15 billion dollars, but we will increase and God will bless us and he will multiply us because of what is on the leaders. In this house, the anointing that is on Pastor Russ and Judy Joe's life, those gifts that God has placed on them will flow down to us. Whatever those giftings are, and then he's gifted us in order to do some of these things. And he's gifted you in order to do some of these things. It's not just them. It's not just the leadership. It's every one of you. It's every one of us that are here. There is something that God wants to do with our lives. Pastor Brian Cuff, number of years, prophesied from the pulpit right here that this is going to be the place of the gathering of the gifted. Here you are. Welcome. <laughs> it's not by chance that you guys are here. It's not just the fivefold giftings that God placed. There is gifting sitting right here, and there are giftings in here that needs to be activated. And as we're following and we're submitting and we're listening, God will activate the giftings on your life, whatever that might be. Some are gifted for business. Some are gifted for leadership. Some are gifted for whatever. But there are giftings here that needs to be activated. And as we're submitting ourselves to the leaders, then God will multiply that and, bring, and activate that. Amen? Amen. Who can count how many times Rian said the word billion this morning? <laughs> I'm like, but doesn't it just do something to your mind? Like, you know, that little emoji where the mind goes, like the mind is blown, right? And what I love about him saying that and sharing that is, you know, sometimes we look at where we are and we can't imagine to what God wants to take us to. So we have, to, we have to read things and understand things and talk about things that open our, our, even our soul up to the idea of prospering, our soul up to the idea of fulfilling our dreams. Amen? We have to, like, rise to this place in our spirit and open our soul so that we can live it out. And I love how he talked about the anointing of that leadership. It's so important, the anointing that's on leadership. Because it also, I was thinking back to Isaiah uh, uh, chapter 10, which talks about the anointing actually breaks the yoke of bondage. That's what it does first. And that's what it continually does. It will break the bondage and the junk and the gunk off your life to then cause you to go into anointing of prosperity. Prosperity. Amen. In every area. Third John chapter or verse two says, uh, beloved, I pray that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That's the heart of a pastor, right? Is to help us prosper and help us to come up to a new place. Amen. So, oh my goodness, the lessons of leadership in the life of David. And what, what struck me more than anything, and Rian and I were sitting yesterday, and worship team, if you guys want to come up, we're wrapping up. This is my wrap-up. <laughs> this is my wrap-up, you know, and from Michigan, you rap for a while, you know. Josh and I come from Michigan, and we come from, I come from a church, a gospel church, where they can preach and preach and preach, right, until they'll stay all day. Don't worry, we won't make you stay all day. We know what time to stop. <clears throat> but as Rian and I were pondering over the story of David, what struck me more than anything 
honestly was his relationships. He led from a place of deep love and deep relationship, and he let people in. And then even when he let people in, he was betrayed over and over again, right? And then his generals, they betrayed each other in the middle of that. Listen, God is calling you to lead in the middle of your fight, in the middle of your pain, in the middle of being hurt, in the middle of a storm. He's calling us up higher. Amen? Hallelujah. I just sense it in my heart so much today. You know, and then in Solomon's life, I'm going to read this scripture to you. And this is, this is all part of our covenant, right? David had a covenant, Rian mentioned, was one of the five covenants with, that God made with man, made with all of mankind through one person. God is a covenant God. <laughs> and so he made this covenant with David. And then through his son Solomon, as he built the temple, it says, I read, we read last week, um, 1 Kings 5, 3 through 5, but I'm going to back up and read 1 Kings 4, 29 through 34. And it said, and God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding. <laughs> And largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Listen, you guys, God wants to open your heart and make it bigger and larger so that you can hold more and do more for him. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled, the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. We said billions a lot. Now we're saying wisdom a lot. Then Ethan the Ezrite and Heman, and he names all these people. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. His fame was in all the surrounding nations for his wisdom. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And in verse 34, And men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So stand up with me, if you will, this morning. I'm going back to that verse, verse 29. It says, and God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart so it couldn't even be measured. Amen? And so close your eyes with me. This morning, <laughs> Some of you have been looking for wisdom, been looking for more wisdom, and you've been looking and, and wanting to understand, how do I do this, and what do I do here, and how do I handle this? And he has given you exceedingly great understanding by the anointing and the flow and the power of the Holy Ghost. And so you just tap into it this morning and receive that equipment that he's already given you. Ha. And some of you are saying, how do I do that? By faith. By that, faith is like this muscle in your spirit, and it reaches out, and it says, I have that. That's mine. That's in the Word, and that's for me, and I take it in, and I'm going to experience that. I'm going to live in that kind of wisdom. Hallelujah. Ha. And so I know there's some of you here uh, that you have been sensing that you're supposed to step up and you're supposed to lead and you're supposed to do different things. And so today's the day that you make a commitment to the Lord and obey. Today's the day, Lord, we commit to you and we obey. <laughs> 